Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Bound prayer. Heavenly Father, we are transitioning from singing songs of praise and worship to now hearing your word proclaimed. I pray that you open our hearts to hear the message that you have for us, your written word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. That was encouraging. I leaned over to Hope and asked her to take a look at Reese and, and Mariah to see two young girls, ages six and nine, say grace wins, to, to get that in their minds and then eventually in their hearts early. Grace wins, grace wins. So cool, very encouraging this Sunday morning. Well, see, I don't know if I'm encouraged by this next statement as much as I am encouraged by that. Actually, I would say I am not as encouraged by this next statement as I am with what I just saw with the two young ladies, but I don't understand when people say, have their cake and eat it too. I, I mean, I get what it's implying, but I don't understand the reference. Have their cake and eat it too? What exactly does that really mean? Well, I, okay, we, we know what it means. You can't have it both ways, but why cake and eat it too? I'm just going to throw that out there. Don't understand that. But when it comes to the gospel, we cannot have it both ways. It is an impossibility to think that you can have it both ways. What is the restaurant chain that said, have it your way? No, Burger King, right? It's not the case. When it comes to the gospel, we need to know what the word of God says. So please open with me to Galatians. And that is precisely what the Apostle Paul is doing. He is telling the Galatians, you cannot have your cake and eat it too. You cannot have it your way. The title for today's sermon is Free to be Righteous. We are in Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. The idea that we want to learn today is this. Through Jesus Christ, we're free to love our way to righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, we're free to love our way to to righteousness. And it almost seems like that statement saying you're going to earn your righteousness by your love, but that's not what the Apostle Paul is teaching us today. We're free to love, and it leads to righteousness. So please follow along as I read from Galatians, which will not be on your screen this morning because I neglected to put it in there. I want to read from Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Amen. The first question we ask of those verses is this, how do you stand firm? How do you stand firm? You stand for, firm by accepting grace. Accept grace and you can stand firm. We see this right here. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. See, this verse is ending what we started in Galatians 4.28. Last week, Pastor Rich walked us through when it started the argument. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of the promise. But just as the time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him 
who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. That's what this verse is doing. It's ending those verses there. What we see is Paul reassuring the Galatians of their freedom. He's telling them, you are free. You are not in slavery. Re remember the old army commercials from the 80s? Be all that you can be in the army. I shouldn't have done that now. I'm going to be asked to lead worship and that commercial will be... <laughs> you guys, you guys understand. You got what the army was trying to tell you. Be all that you can be. That's what the Apostle Paul's saying. Be all that you can be. Be free. Be what you've been called to be as a Christian. Free. Be free in the gospel of grace. As believers, we display relief and freedom to those enslaved by the burdens of the world. That's our freedom. We're free to show others. That we don't have those same burdens. Now, we have issues and problems that we have to deal with. Life's not going to be fair or any better because we're believers. But the way in which we handle those burdens and problems because of our freedom lets others know that you can be free too, but you're allowing the world to get you and let you down. Allow this thought to be the foundation now for the next six verses for what we're going to study this morning, this freedom. That's what Paul's doing. He's reassuring the Galatians of their freedom. Now we need to look at the text and allow this to reassure us of our freedom in the gospel of grace. Do you notice who Paul is addressing? If you look in this verse, who is, who is Paul addressing specifically? Those who at least had heard the gospel. We can't be assured that he's addressing believers per se, but we know that he's at least addressing those who have heard the gospel. Now, is he addressing believers? I would imagine he is as well. But the way in which he says, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery, leads us to believe that he's addressing those who have at least heard the gospel. So the question becomes, if he's talking about this yoke of slavery, what is a yoke? And this is what a yoke is. They don't look like they're having fun. I mean, the guy looking into the camera with both eyes is like, really? And then the guy that is one eye looking at us right there, he's like, and you gave me this guy? These guys are enslaved. These are draft animals. That's what a yoke was used for. And somebody would stand behind them, crack the whip, and make them plow the field. I've seen it done. We're from northern Indiana. Amish country is right down the road. Those animals aren't leaving the field. They're not free to roam. Paul's saying, don't be like these draft animals yoked. Be free in the gospel. That's why he says, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So as we see this verse summarizing Galatians 4, 28 through 31, we could ask the question, so what is Paul saying in layman's terms? What is he saying in layman's terms? Salvation isn't God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, plus my good works. That's, that's, that's it. Salvation is not God authoring salvation, Jesus executing the work on the cross, and the Holy Spirit teaching us salvation, plus all those good things that I can do myself. That's not salvation. Salvation is all of that minus our good works. And that's why we're free to live from this grace. So don't forget that grace is freedom. Don't let Satan or anyone else put a yoke of slavery around your neck. And remember, a yoked slave cannot stand firm. A yoked slave isn't free to roam. A yoked slave cannot love their way to righteousness. 
We're free to love our way to righteousness, but a yoked slave cannot do any of that. The second question we're asking of the text is this, how might we reject grace? If we heard how Paul sums up that first verse by saying, it's not about our good works, how could we reject grace? We reject grace by relying on our good works. Have you ever had your credit card declined while you're standing in, in line or there's a long line behind you? Have you ever gone up to pay and you're like, I think I got enough in my checking account to cover what I'm going to buy, but I'm not sure. And you got that nervous energy or, or just that uncomfortable feeling like maybe I don't have enough or maybe I didn't pay off my credit card so there's not enough to, is this going to get declined? Or maybe it just got declined because somebody compromised your account. I've had that happen. I've gone to pay for something and there's enough money to pay for what I'm buying. I'm buying a pack of gum. Then you find out that your bank shut your card off because somebody compromised your account. What if you were in that position where there's a long line behind you and you're trying to pay for something and then all of a sudden the person behind you asks, hey, I'll pay for that for you. I know that you can't. In your pride, would you reject them? Would you reject them in your pride? Because see, what is Paul saying here? He says, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. If your card's been compromised or you don't have enough money in your account, let's say, because we really don't, that plastic card is of no advantage to me. But the guy behind me wants to pay. In my pride, am I going to reject him and say, no, you're not going to pay for that. I'm going to make everybody else wait in line. If we accept anything other than the cross, then we're allowing Satan to play on our pride. We're making Christ no advantage to us. It is to our advantage to understand that it is Christ in his bank account, not ours. It is his work. What's Paul in his concern with circumcision? He's been talking about circumcision a lot here in Galatians. Why does he keep bringing up circumcision? See, it's not about the health advantage that Paul's addressing. It's about the disadvantage of the work. Any number of doctors would tell you that circumcision is actually beneficial to your health. So he's not advocating to go against circumcision. And I think he encouraged Timothy in this regard for the health reasons. But what he's doing is, and what he's reminding the Galatians of is, circumcision is a work. You're turning this into a work. You're saying, look, I'm circumcised. I'm earning that righteousness. But we know that that leads to pride. And Satan loves to play on our pride and our uh, ability to think that we can earn this on our own. Do you notice how Paul opened his address to the Galatians in this verse? If you look at verse 2, what is Paul doing? How does he address this? He says, look, I, Paul, say to you. He's flexing his apostolic muscle once again. So let's go back to Galatians 1, 15 through 18. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. I remember Pastor Rich teaching us, preaching from that passage and reminding us that God chooses those in which he saves. Pastor Rich taught us how Paul spent three years in the Arabian desert with Jesus himself. That's why we can see Paul say, look, I, Paul. That's why he has the ability to flex his apostolic muscle. And I, I don't know about you. But with all this calling that God does, 
I don't have that kind of authority. My, my ability to call somebody else sounds like this. Leighton, Reese, it's time for dinner. That is the extent of my ability to call anybody. We don't call the shots, but we get to serve the one who does, just like Paul. If you're attempting to call the shots in your life, you're rejecting grace. If you're attempting to call the shots, you're a yoked slave. We need to be encouraged by Paul as he is indicating that he is speaking on behalf of Jesus. When he says, look, I, Paul, he's not saying and implying that this is his word or his message. We have to go back and see, no, he spent time with Christ for three years. He's speaking on behalf of Jesus. That's where he's getting his authority. How might we reject grace? We, we know that it's if we rely upon our good works. We see in verse 3 where it says, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. See, if Paul flexed his apostolic muscle in, in verse 2, we see him speaking with courtroom authority in verse 3. What do you think of when you hear the word testimony? When you hear the word testimony, you think of truth. If you're testifying, you're telling the truth. And that's precisely what Paul's doing here. We cannot have the mindset that salvation happens because of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and everything that I can do. That's not truth. That's false. That's a lie. So each and every one of us right now should understand that when Chuck asked us to take a deep breath, that led to absolutely nowhere or nothing. So I'm going to ask you to take a deep breath right now, but before you do so, have in mind that that heavy burden has been lifted. We can live free while the rest of the world cannot because they haven't allowed grace to be their freedom. They've yoked themselves. They've thought to themselves they have to do a work. So I'm being serious. Take a deep breath right now, everybody. I'm free. There's no burden on my shoulders. That should feel good. That's what Paul's reminding us. You don't have to earn your salvation. Accept this gift. Accept this grace. And you will be free to love all the way to righteousness. That is relief. He writes, every man who accepts circumcision is obligated to keep the whole law. So circumcision being a work that he is addressing, if you accept, I am going to earn my own salvation, then you better be ready because you're obligated to keep the whole entire law. See, Pac-Man was released by Nameco in 1980. It took 19 years. And Pac-Man was huge. Everybody here remembers Pac-Man. Easy, simple game to play. That game was released in 1980. It took 19 years for the first perfect game to be achieved. The man who did it, his name is Billy Mitchell, lives over in Hollywood, Florida. Character. He, he rocks a mullet. He wears an American uh, tie every day. It was his life's obsession to achieve a perfect game. He already had notoriety as the best Pac-Man player for 19 years almost, prior to achieving this. But he didn't achieve the perfect game. And it didn't count unless you did it at a sanctioned place where they could verify he did it. 19 years. See, the thing is, once that coin was entered into the slot, you were obligated to play a flawless game. And if you didn't, it was game over. They made a movie about Billy Mitchell called Chasing Ghosts in his pursuit. He's, he's met the founders of Nameco, the guys who designed the machine. He's, he's held in high regard. He's only done it once. He scored 3,333,360 points. Perfect game. You guys know how Pac-Man works, right? Eat every single pellet. Eat each power pellet. Eat a power pellet, the ghost turn into blue ghosts, then you can eat them. The more levels you get to, the higher you get, 
you eat the power pellet and they only turn ghosts for one second, maybe, maybe less than a second, and you have to still eat all of them. He would spend 15 to 20, 30 minutes on a board to stack the ghosts so he could eat them all with one chomp. Dedicated his life to do this, did it one time. You want to be obligated to keep the whole law? How many times do you think he failed? How many times do you think we've failed? You want to rely on your good works? You're obligated to fail. It's game over. And that's what the Galatians weren't getting right. And that's what Paul is reminding them of. You're free. You're not yoked in slavery. In fact, Billy Mitchell tried to pursue the Donkey Kong record, had it for a little bit, and he said that he had to stop. Why? Well, wife, kids, and a job got in the way. Understandable. He was enslaved to trying to achieve the perfect game. Attempting to be a good Christian comes with strings attached, and we have to remember that. That mentality of, I'm a good Christian. Well, there's strings attached to that. And attempting to be a good Christian is treating grace like it's an obligation. Grace is not an obligation. Grace is freedom. Live the grace God has given us like it's intended to be lived. Freedom to love onward towards righteousness. And we're going to get into that a little bit more in depth, what that means. But obligation contradicts the freedom that we see in verse 1. Later in chapter 6, when we eventually get there in Galatians, Paul says the ones circumcised don't keep the law anyway. So let's compare all of this to Deuteronomy 27, 26. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them, and all the people shall say, Amen. See, Jesus became a curse because of our inability. God exhausted His wrath upon Jesus. Jesus became that curse for us. We've all heard of paying it forward, correct? Well, paying it forward is all fun and games when you're in the drive-thru until the people behind you are picking up lunch for the swim team. It's a good idea until that happens, right? I may not pay it forward if that's the case. Just be thankful for the person that did it for me. But see, Jesus... And speaking of a swim team, is the lone lifeguard for us. He's the lone lifeguard for humanity that's drowning. And don't let Satan fool you into thinking that you're relying on Jesus when you're really just treading water going absolutely nowhere. Not free to roam, kind of like a yoked slave. Have you ever thought to yourself, well, at least I don't do what so-and-so does. I might be a sinner, but you know, hey, I might check out the lady in front of me in the checkout line, but at least I'm not down there at Follow Avenue or at the uh, strip club. I mean, because that's worse. I mean, seriously. And it's a good thing I don't know the name of that place. If you guys notice, I was struggling to come up with what's the name of that place. <laughs> And I'm being serious. Lookers. Lookers. <laughs> checking out the lady in the checkout line is just as bad as checking out the lady while you're inside of lookers. That's when we can understand the freedom of grace and say, thank you, Jesus. Take that deep breath. Whew, those heavy burdens are lifted off of my shoulders because I am incapable. Now, does that mean that we have the freedom to go sin? And that's exactly what Paul's not saying. Just because we have this grace doesn't mean we can just go and sin all we want. No. We're free to love. We're free to pursue righteousness. The third and final question we're asking is this, where does grace and faith lead? Righteousness. Simple enough. Grace and faith leads to righteousness. The very first part of uh, verse 4. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. Do you know what alienated and estranged have in common? 
the words alienated and estranged, they, they both mean to be severed. So how do we typically use the word estranged in society today? Oh, so-and-so is estranged from their wife. How would we use the term alienated in our society today? He or she has alienated themselves. Both say the same thing. I want to go at it alone. You are alienated and severed and estranged from salvation if you attempt to earn your own righteousness. This is precisely why we should never say WWJD. And I'm sure most of you remember the wristbands that were popular, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Because that gets turned into going about it on my own. I'm going to do exactly what Jesus did. No, you're not going to do exactly what Jesus did because you're incapable. He became the curse because you are unable yourself. Now, was the concept behind that bad? Was the thought process wrong? Probably not. But does it get distorted? Yes. So should we be focused on what Jesus would do and then try to mimic? Or should we be focused on this and make it more simple and more theologically correct by saying GWS? GWS stands for God's Word Says. God's word says, I'm free to pursue righteousness. God's word says, I'm free to love. God's word says, I'm free. Free at last, free at last, free at last. We are free. Free. We are free because of God's grace. And his word reminds me of his grace. And the more I learn about that grace, the more I'm pursuing righteousness. I'm already made righteous because of the work of Jesus. But I can move towards that righteousness and learn about that righteousness because of God and His work and what He's done. But I have His Word to help me in that process. Where does grace and faith lead to righteousness? The last part of verse 4 says, you have fallen away from grace. So the question must be asked, can you lose your salvation? Is that what Paul's saying? Is he saying, since you've fallen away from grace, you can lose your salvation? No. Paul is addressing those who have tasted but not received. I want to go to Hebrews to back this up. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Now, the key to this is this. I've attended a church and had a pastor who was teaching me who told me you could lose your salvation and he quoted this verse. I was young in my faith and little in my study of the Bible, so I took his word for it, but kind of wasn't necessarily on board, but was sort of at the same time. Now I look at this text and I say to myself, that's not what Paul's saying. Because what is he saying? He's saying it is impossible in the case of those, those that what? Have been enlightened. They've been enlightened. They've tasted. They've shared. It doesn't say they received the Holy Spirit. It says they shared, they saw the Holy Spirit's work. It says they, they tasted the heavenly gift. You can taste but not swallow. They didn't receive the heavenly gift. And they were enlightened. They heard the gospel, but they didn't accept and receive the gospel. So that's not what Paul's saying. Now, we're addressing this because somebody could look at this text. Now, this isn't the main text in Galatians that an Arminian would go to, somebody who would say you could lose your salvation. They would go to this. But... Somebody could read this in Galatians and say, ha-ha, right there, in the verse 4. You can lose your salvation. You can be fallen away from grace. See, I've yet to work at a barber shop that doesn't receive a Playboy subscription in the mail. And it's kind of ironic to me because I read my Bible on the days I work 
in the morning early in our back room, and there's a stack of Playboys right next to all my highlighters, like you guys have seen I highlight, my Bible and my books from Friendship Grace Brother in Church. And oftentimes I just kind of chuckle, I'm like, here I am reading my Bible next to a stack of Playboys. So let's say Joe Blow, who we know ushers at such and such church in town, and he walks into the shop and you see him pick up a playboy and peruse through it while he's waiting to get his hair cut. You know that Joe Blow goes to such and such church and you know that Joe Blow is an usher. So he volunteers himself at this church. So we could ask, just because he attends church and volunteers as an usher, does that make him justified righteous by the Lord? And everything that Paul's teaching us this morning, just because he attends church and volunteers, is he justified righteous? No. That doesn't make him justified righteous. But could a justified righteous church-going volunteer who submits to his flesh at times be justified righteous before the Lord? Yes. That's an extreme case. But put yourself right there. Do you submit to the flesh? Because that's really what Paul's getting to. Are you submitting yourself to the Spirit in Him, allowing you to love your way to righteousness in the Spirit's work? Or are you submitting to the flesh? Are you willing to be patient with your faith? Are you willing to learn to submit to the Spirit? Do you say things like, I've learned? Or do you say, I'm learning? I catch myself in that all the time. I'll say, oh, I've learned. And I'm like, I'm learning to. That's submitting to the Spirit. We need to be willing to allow the Spirit to teach us. He's the one communicating this truth to us. What God has authored, what Jesus has done, the Spirit reveals this truth to us. And we need to be patient. Where does grace and faith lead? To get through that, it leads to righteousness. Verse 5, For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Salvation is a past, present, and future action. Traditionally, when we hear people give their testimonies, they address their past and confuse their future with the present. People will give a testimony and they'll tell you, well, this is where I was before, this is where I'm at now. They, they forget that whole part of sanctification, that whole process that God takes us through to make us holier, to make us righteous. That's where we're at. We've been saved. We're seen as redeemed. We're seen as righteous because of the work of Jesus. But we're moving towards this righteousness. And grace has given us the freedom to love our way to righteousness. And we see that at the very beginning of verse 5, where it says hope in righteousness, and that's contingent on two things. The spirit and faith, not works. Not anything that you can do on your own. So this is precisely why we're asking this question and now moving on to verse 6. Where does grace and faith lead? Righteousness. This is the first time Paul used the word love in the book of Galatians. And here we recognize the second type of works. First, there are works of the Mosaic law. And second, there are works of love. Two totally different types of works. Works of the Mosaic law does not lead to righteousness. Upholding the law teaches you how to be in relationship with the Lord, but that doesn't lead to righteousness. It doesn't lead to salvation. Works of love come after you are saved. After you've received the Spirit, you're allowing Him to move you in a direction to love others through your work. So let's focus on the part where he says, faith working through love. See, charity is not charity if the one giving money determines how the money gets spent. A work isn't love if I'm motivated to do the work only if it favors my advantage. I could do some nice things for some people in this room, but if I'm only doing it for my own advantage, if I have an ulterior motive that's hidden, that's not love. That's me trying to get the upper hand. Paul says right there in verse 5, the second part, faith working through love is 
to love with no strings attached. Faith working through love is freedom to pursue righteousness. Check your motivation. Why are you doing what you're doing? We all need to do that. If we check our motivation and we feel convicted, then we're allowing the Spirit to teach us to love towards being righteous. Think of it like you know that you're righteous in the sight of God, but now you are on a journey to learn more about that righteousness. We need to open up ourselves to say, I am learning, not I have learned. I'm learning. Everything I've learned, I'm continuing to learn more about. Ask yourself the question, why is it I'm doing what it is I am doing? What we see here today is this. Through Jesus Christ and Him only, we're free to love our way to righteousness. Because what Paul's saying here is the opposite of that. You don't receive righteousness if you go about it that way. It's a negative. Today, we looked at it from a positive perspective instead of a negative perspective. We want to be encouraged in that freedom to pursue righteousness. We ask the question, how do you stand firm? You stand firm by accepting grace. How might we reject grace? We reject grace if we rely on our good works. Where does grace and faith lead? Righteousness. Heavenly Father, You are an awesome God. And it is so easy for us to just forget how faithful you are to what you've taught us in your word, Lord. I pray that as we go about our week this week, we can be reminded as we study the word that you are faithful. You can be our example. You reassure us in everything that you do, everything that we've seen you do, and everything that you've promised that you will do. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ who makes all this possible. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.